Welcome back to our show. This is the second part of three parts about the Halekolani heaven with um, the three guys from the block and one guy we're missing today, that's DeSoto. DeSoto has to serve. Well, in all fairness, he has to try to stay above the waters to finish up an exhibition at his Bishop Museum about surfing. But our main guy, the leader of the crew here, is with us again, uh, live from uh, Long Beach, California, Ron Lindgren. Hi, Ron. Hi, Martin. Great to be with you again. Good to have you back. And uh, can we do a little uh, recap, a little summary of what we talked about last time? Yeah, I'd like to say, uh, last time, I was mentioning that uh, we were, uh, as clients, we were called over to Tokyo to meet our uh, our clients on a personal and face-to-face -face basis, and we managed to ingratiate ourselves with them, and uh, with a successful face-to-face -face meeting, uh, Ed and I flew then back to our office in Long Beach, pretty much secure that our client was really determined to build a luxury hotel on Waikiki Beach to my design. But this would be an unusual hotel in the midst of, you know, raucous and phonetic Waikiki. And by that, I mean 465 guest rooms ensconced within what would have to be a quiet and secluded environment, but also one which had a distinctly elegant residential scale. And, and such a residential character would be in keeping, of course, with the past 45-year history of the Holly Kalani. And it would also be utterly unique as luxurious, elegant placemaking in the very heart of hyperactive Waikiki. And besides, as we know, the Hawaiian name, Hale Kalani, means house befitting heaven. And later I'll be talking about how I attempted to accomplish all this with a combination of urban planning and architecture. Absolutely. And may we go to the first slide here, which is, has also been the last slide last time. And I owe it to our uh, exotic escapism es expert, Zuzana, who lured me into the Lures lounge living room. And this in the front is actually the table. That's her favorite table. And you were very elaboratively talking about the artwork in the back. So now we go to the next slide. And um, this reminds me of my, my son, Lenny, who is in the midst of medical school. And the pedagogy is how they teach them about the human body, that they first talk about all the bits and pieces and the parts. So they believe that the whole is um, a sum of its parts. And besides all what architecture is, this is certainly an aspect. And we want to point out here to uh, the very detail you're pointing out to with your hand and share with us a little background intel on that one, Ron. Yeah, yeah, first I should say that the, this is a stairway that is off of the living room in the Lewis house. And this brings to mind yet another blessing uh, I had as architect, and that is that I got to work with an uh, interior designer who uh, did such a wonderful job at the Kahala 20 years before, a gentleman by the name of Bob Egan. And look at the warmth and tradition he provides here. There's a reeded wood ceiling overhead. There are gang together uh, folding doors with uh, uh, tropical lures. The existing cola wood floor was just polished up and made to look as beautiful as, as it was. And then he also made a nice combination of uh, some carpet and some cola wood on the steps. What I'm holding in my guilty hand <laughs> is the fact that I made uh, a bit of a mistake as an architect there. Those spindles were meant to be very elegant and very slim, and they were too slim. In other words, if you grab the, the beautiful wooden handrail, you could waggle it back and forth four inches either way. Uh, as, as the person in charge of being the office rep, I had to suddenly come up with a solution to that, and the solution happened to be finding some of the same wood and creating some wood blocks and wrapping them around just some of those spindles so that the stair was safe. And in fact, it actually sort of adds to the traditional look of the stair. And I, I think we can call this architectural prototyping at its best, you know, trial and error <laughs> and come up with improvements through that. 
So you've been working with wood. Let's go to the next slide, something you already generally talked about, but here in detail, you also work with steel, tube steel and fabric. This was an, an attempt on my part to expand the Lures house, the existing Lures house, which we renovated and remodeled, expand the dining experience of the Orchids restaurant, both out into the lawn towards Diamond Head and out into a lawn out to, to the ocean. And I, I wanted to add something that uh, wasn't so much architecture, but it looked like maybe it was something that had been added, you know, years even before uh, the, the new Holly Cloney was built. And so I used a light steel frame and a interesting canopy material that's both waterproof and fireproof. And uh, this, is, this ends up looking very informal and also, may I say, inexpensive. Certainly true. And again, reference to our tropical mobiles here. This is our PIing uh, vehicle here that we recently had to redo the soft top. And this is single layer roof. And same thing, the frame is still good as yours. And you just stretch it over it. And that does the job. It's a very tropical way of doing that versus sitting in our hermetic invasive cars with the AC on, right? So let's talk about the Indeed. concrete bones again. Let's go to the next slide and tell us the intel on that one. Yeah, uh, with these columns, I was experimenting with softening them in a way. And I was using 45 degree chamfers everywhere, chamfered corners, uh, recessed panels, which always give some life to a column uh, and scale. And there was also chamfer back at 45. We'll see later that even the top of the column is chamfered and the beams that, that lie on them are chamfered. Yeah. But this also shows, in terms of poured in place concrete, what a fine job my contractor did. It's not such a small thing that those two electrical outlets, outdoor outlets, yeah. are perfectly centered and are not crooked. Yeah, absolutely. And what's also a very fine detail, what you point out with your hand there is actually that out of the columns grows sort of the framing of the natural environment, the green. And let's keep continuing about the, in, the, the perfect and masterful sort of inclusion and incorporation of the natural environment into the built environment with the next slide. Yeah, this is, uh, this is an example of uh, the old highway colony at its funkiest and best ambiance. This was a how tree restaurant uh, from the 1930s. Uh, I think it even was there during the war years. Mm -hmm. And there was this incredible how tree. And notice what looks like very modern, slim steel beams mm -hmm. and uh, round columns. Yeah. And let's jump to the next one and see how you interpreted that. Yeah, where the how terrace restaurant was, is now really where uh, the House Without a Key restaurant, the new House Without a Key restaurant was built. And so thinking of, of the past, uh, I and the landscape architect got busy with the idea that why not grow four sandpaper vines uh, up and into a trellis, and at parts of the year, the sandpaper vine turns into glorious purple flowers. And look at that sort of almost a uh, high tree complexity to the, uh, uh, the, the root and the, the whole system of the plant. Exactly. Again, an evocation of something from the past. Yeah. And this is the, when, when you go there and have wonderful breakfast buffet, which you invited us uh, to, so thank you. And where all the yummy things are, we want to go now with the next slide because that's on the other end of the breakfast area. This is one of my, my favorite uh, photographs, really, not because my ugly mug is in it, but uh, the fact that it's showing one of the courtyards in the background. Uh, it's showing a lot of plants growing out of the ground. These are tropical plants. Uh, uh, cocoa palms, uh, 70, 80 feet tall. But right behind me uh, is the ju judicious use of tropical plants in planters. Mm -hmm. And so, this looks so residential. It, it almost looks like a, a, a residential garden that one is walking through. Absolutely. And next picture, uh, obviously, if you have watched the Killingsworth shows of the many we have done and the many more to come, 
There's also a theme to be continued here, uh, which is the sort of builds in integration of plants in these sort of concrete troughs and planter boxes. So that is here too. And uh, next slide, you also, usually the, the plants grow up, but you also have plants that grow down, as in this case. Can you explain us where that is and why? Yeah, this is uh, part of the entry experience of, of, of walking into the hotel as a pedestrian. This is a portico. Uh, I'm holding very tightly, it seems, onto one strand of a Thunbursia uh, vine. Uh, at certain times of the year, in late spring and early summer, there are literally hundreds of those vines hanging down. So it almost looks like a white cloud suspended underneath that trellis. Mm -hmm. And this is actually where the, almost a little bit, you know, to, well, shouldn't discriminate anyone, but this is where the smokers are. So the smokers have a very nice place and probably when they were all down, <laughs> Probably it camouflages them and makes them feel less guilty, right? So thanks to you. Yeah, this is a this is a Japanese-owned hotel. Yeah. Many Japanese people come here, and as I've learned, and I think many people have learned from especially business relationships with the Japanese, they smoke a lot. So there's one spot in the entire hotel mm -hmm. outdoors, and that happens to be at the end of this particular portico, yeah. shielded by the Sunbergia vines. And let's look at that sort of architectural element along the other direction with the next slide here. We have to say there's also uh, the very you know, new entry to the lovely security team that is nice to everyone, including us, who are always wandering around there, more or less dressed, as we saw and talked about in the, in the last show here. But explain to us a little bit the clever strategy of that connector. Well, these are, uh, here's where you see where the tailored columns and beams actually form uh, architecture, in this case, porticos. And the porticos connect all of the public spaces at grade, and they're all at 14 foot 8 inches on center, which turns out to be a nice dimension so that two couples can pass each other easily mm -hmm. as they're walking from place mm -hmm. to place. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really proud of the appearance of these porticos because it, to me, it just seems like they provide a really elegant measured cadence when you're walking through them. And I have to confess that I sort of used the idea of even religious cloisters as an inspiration for these, uh, these uh, porticos. Yeah, absolutely. Well achieved. And they have obviously a very poetic processional quality. But at the same time, as with cloisters, who are very clever architectural manifestations of sort of navigations uh, through space, it also helps the service people to get very quickly and almost secretly from one place to the other one. And the place where you go, we're going to unveil at the very end. We, we have been talking about the aspect of green and the natural environment, but in, in, in Hawaii, there's also the color blue uh, manifested through water that you masterfully incorporated into the uh, building, which we see one example in the next slide. So tell us. You know, here again, we're in the entry pavilion uh, for pedestrians. We'll be seeing that uh, uh, in, in the next few photographs. Uh, Izzy, Kalia, and Lures Road are right outside. And not only is the sound of water so soothing, but it's also masking. And in this case, it was doing both things uh, so that the sound of traffic, uh, aided by yet another feature that we'll show you soon, uh, completely uh, canceled out the sounds of the city uh, beyond the secluded hotel. Yeah, and me being the nitpicky guy, I urged the hotel management to take that rope away, which used, used, wasn't there to begin with, but I guess some people ended up in the shallow pool. Probably didn't drown because it's not deep enough, but I say educate the people and somehow deal with liability in a, in a less eyesore way. So, but what you just talked about is uh, even more visible and, and clear in the next picture and explain us the, the strategy of of, of this constellation and composition? One of, the, one of the things that I had as an idea that would be very unique 
to approaching a new hotel, especially for those who see it for the first time, is that you wouldn't be driving up uh, into some motor court or, or at the shadow of some huge uh, tower, but instead you would be walking down Kalia Road or driving down Kalia Road, and you would see what perhaps you thought of at first as being sort of a large, commodious home with nothing but blue sky above it. And of course, when we get into the, the, that building a little further along in this presentation, you'll see that it's actually uh, an open air lounge entry space. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm standing at the right in front of the major feature that really does quiet down uh, the city. And I purposely created this strong band of waterfall. It's a, it's a bunch of pieces of, of a handsome green marble stacked on each other sticking out just far enough so when a seed of water pours over it, uh, it splashes and, and makes sounds. And but I remember you saying you that was that was prototyping on the job too, right? Trying. Yeah, that, uh, that, that was a gamble. We weren't sure if it was even going to work. <laughs> it's one of those things where I was blessed again. But notice also that you look over that waterfall and you see the street. And yeah. that was my idea too. You see the street, you don't hear the noise, and you suddenly realize that you're entering into a unique, secluded, and quiet place, and raucous Waikiki is just outside. Exactly, and in contrary, uh, you thanked me because I was like suicidally in the middle of the road, which is actually Kalia Road is, is perpendicular to that. That is Lewis Road, right? Oh, and, I'm sorry, yes, and Lewis Don't Road. worry, and, and, and the, the clever trick is that actually, uh, where you're standing there in the property already is few steps up and so being on the road you're these few steps down so you cannot see into it so it keeps it discreet and private and mysterious right while again as Indeed. you explained when you're in the building you have the overview and you have the orientation so you don't feel stuck I mean, that's a very clever move I mean talking at having been a classicist you're right along in line with him with these super exciting things that uh, we will later point out when this was built. This is in the peak of postmodernism, and we will applaud you many times down in this show and the next show is that you, for many of us, have been and are the best postmodern architect that we know. So let's, uh, let's move on and already uh, show now what you were pointing out once you're in the space and you look at the gatehouse from the other direction, right? Yeah, what seemed to be perhaps a residence to someone who came in there the first time is actually an open-air lounge. And here you see it from a secluded courtyard, very broad grass lawn. And I have to jump in for a moment. Uh, we were also blessed to have the finest landscapist in Hawaii, Richard Tong, working on this project for us. Richard uh, wrote the book a modern, called The Modern Tropical Garden in 1955, which is still the textbook uh, today. He was uh, a strong force in developing gardens in what he called a theme of tropicalia. He, he said that gardens in the tropics should look the part rather than being pale copies of, of some other styles. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is that my client, Suhei Akuda, did not agree. <laughs> he had visited any number of other hotels in the Outer Islands and saw tropical vegetation used lushly and densely and actually very beautifully. But in his mind, it all looked the same, and he couldn't remember one hotel from the other. Mm. What he wanted was broad lawns uh, interspersed with cocoa palms, a very few uh, specimen trees, and bordering flower, flowering plants. He loved the lawns around Iolani Palace. Mm -hmm. With uh, his determination to go his way, uh, Richard Tong recused himself from the project, and I actually applaud him for, of course, holding up for his principles, mm -hmm. but he did not do our landscaping. Well, and you rehabilitated him because you brought in the jungle architecturally, and let's go to the next slide, Ryan. Here we're seeing the inside of the pedestrian entry pavilion. And I'll say in advance that I have a separate uh, interesting pavilion, which is has a, a porch, which has to do with the automobile entry. Mm -hmm. But here we have a two-story space. It is skylit, 
but uh, I put some trellis across it so one doesn't look up into the underside of uh, shiny glass or plastic. Mm -hmm. And here we have the tailored columns and beams, and you can see how the beams seem to slide through the columns mm -hmm. in a structural expressionism that was Ed Killingsworth's uh, prime motif. Absolutely, which you refined again with a 45 degree wedging. From there, let's keep on going through the cloister courtyards. Let's wander around. And while we do uh, use this picture here and sharing you sharing with us your long-term professional relationship with a lady called Leslie Wheel. Here again, uh, I, I, I must be boring people with talking about how much I've been blessed. But here it's again, a woman, a woman who was so uh, instrumental in creating the beautiful lighting at the Kahala 20 years ago, joined us in this endeavor at the Holly Cluny. So I'm looking at one of her custom-built sconces, and uh, and these were her designs. And those sconces, when they're lit at night, provide a spray of light. Uh, on the columns that is really romantic and interesting and leads us to the next slide. Yeah, leads us to the next slide and just reminding us that 20 years ago in the mid 60s, she was the leading lighting uh, designer in the Kahala and 20 years later, you called her up and she said, I'm on board, right? Indeed. And uh, there I am sitting, gazing out at uh, Diamond Head and over the pool. What's really nice about those custom-made chandeliers is that they actually sway in the breeze. And that is actually a very nice informal touch. Absolutely. And these spaces you mainly designed for the brides who have their wedding ceremonies on the Howe Terrace, for the security guards, which this is their sort of tour, and for you and me, because I'm sitting there every morning and contemplate. But I want to hear, we're still in the, in the sequence of water. I want to hear the little background story about the waterfall stairs that you're pointing to at the very bottom right. Yes, the, uh, the stairs, for example, that lead in on both sides into the Lewis house are a broad range of waterfall stairs. And we use them in these two two-story stairways as well. What I'm pointing to is that the uh, edge of the stair is a half round, and that uh, I've seen uh, called a waterfall stair in some other people's architecture. So I like the elegance of that, and yet the informality of that uh, particular expression. And they were also way. very provocatively prototyped because you had some permitting wrestling with them, right? Yeah, the, the fact is today, those stairs would be illegal. Uh, because there would be a chance, for example, of someone standing on the step, but when they take the next step, they actually put their uh, foot down on that rounded edge, and they would trip. Yeah. Uh, that, has never, that has never happened in the history of the hotel, I must say. That makes but, us uh, so I, nice. I, I could not get away with such beautiful yeah. stairs today. These were the days. And you look out into the in direction of the ocean, but there's another piece of water in front of us. And let's jump to the next slide and tell us the background story about that huge pool. You'll see in, in some uh, later photographs that this is a classic oval swimming pool. Our client Shuhei Akuda loved it, but when he heard that it was just going to have a white bottom, he didn't agree. And he came up at that time with $150,000 to go to South Africa and buy millions, and I mean literally millions, of tiny little uh, uh, iridescent glass tiles to create the pool bottom. The pool bottom is a Catalia orchid, which also happens to be the hotel's graphic logo. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of a gimmick in this photograph in the sense that the pool looks huge, but uh, the girl floating there on her back very artfully is actually only a five-year-old. <laughs> All right, let's look at the pool and plan. Next picture here is one of the most important drawings that all of a sudden explains it all in plan. And we call this a figure ground plan. And the ground is black. We inverted that. The ocean is black. The public space is black. So are the big black dots in the middle of your project, the courtyards and the pool. 
And the other ones are just very filigree lines, and they come across as that not just in plan, but also in elevation, as we have been experiencing before. There's never chunky stuff in your face. Everything is very dematerial, right? And as, as kind of you know, ambitious that is, is in plan, it's even more ambitious to keep that in elevation. So let's move to the next slide and share what one, of our, uh, one of the Soto's treasures from his treasure box. And this is an artist uh, rendering of uh, the ambitions. So this is like to basically, you know, sell the, sell the design and explain the design. And while the skyline is fictitious, right? So they're actually not the actual buildings, but their anatomy of basically being square volumetric boxes is pretty much, but it, explain why you distinguish yourself from that boxiness. Well, what, I, what I'd like to say really is that this is where I sort of had to become uh, an urban planner. We had to provide a quiet, secluded place. It was the only way that there would be that perceived luxury and that people would be willing to spend the very expensive rates that these rooms uh, managed to uh, procure. And so all around the perimeter of the, of the property, I placed uh, single loaded corridor guest room buildings. In the center, I, I put one double loaded corridor building and that created these two courtyard spaces, uh, one uh, which is part of the entry experience for pedestrians, one which is part of the entry experience for people getting out of their cars, but that's also the uh, recreational pool uh, courtyard. Yeah. Uh, this was the first time in my architectural career that I wasn't creating buildings just as discrete objects in space, mm. but rather creating clearly defined outdoor spaces with buildings. And this was thrilling. But you can also see that the old Helly Clinic was much loved as a low rise experience at the uh, ocean. Yeah. And so I stepped all of the buildings down uh, to only basically one and two stories height at the, at the water. And then my last uh, architectural expression was to cap every building, even the elevator towers, with the very famous and noted Dickey roofs. Absolutely, and there's two things that you actually improved in the execution. One is obviously the pool got oval and not square. Then the uh, house without a key didn't become two-story, but a one-story pavilion. And the Lures house didn't become the sort of Aztec new thing. But last slide, please. What we can see here, this is from the Soto's archives as well. This is just after the completion of the project. And if we can bring up one more slide, uh, but we're out of time now, so we have to leave it with this one here. This is another artist rendering that shows your ambition of not doing what the Sheraton did next door, that big sort of harsh cliff, but that sort of very elegantly cascading down, which you did sort of before with the um, Kapalua Hotel, which we're pointing out in the show. So, Ron, we have to stop here, but to pick up next week again. So thank you for having been with us uh, from Long Beach. And we look forward to the conclusion of your fascinating story. And until then, everyone, uh, thanks for having been with us on the show. Until next week, back with Ron, you please stay very hilariously Hawaiian. Just like Ron. Bye, Ron. Bye, everyone.